If you don't have all the security stuff, you can go to U of A Public, but you just have to authenticate and say, I understand that everybody can see everything I'm about to do. Um, we decided to put together this workshop for a lot of different reasons that, that we'll go through. Some of you were really, really ambitious and started opening up and like reading and trying all the stuff that I've been sending you and panicking, and that's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I mean, the few things that we needed to happen, including downloading our downloading packages, I think most people did. But we're going to go through that step by step just to make sure everybody's got it um, before we move on. I also sent you a data file that's in um, several different formats. You want to have downloaded that. I also sent you the script that we're using today, just so you guys have it. You don't have to like type like fiends. Um, and then I'll show you some new tricks at the end. And I sent you the PowerPoint just because I know some people like to print stuff out in various formats to write on them. So that's kind of the way that I teach classes. I know I'm, I haven't taught here before, but I'm, I'm the person who will give you everything you could ever possibly need, which doesn't mean that you need all of it all at once. Okay, so don't panic. That's always the rule. So why are we here? Um, I say, why do we want to use R? All the cool kids are doing it. I mean, I mean... Sometimes I'm a nerd, but I'm generally pretty cool. This is uh, 570 coders, um, which are crazy people like me who like to write code. I don't know what you guys do in the middle of the night when you can't sleep, but I actually go look at people's code um, in, my, in my laptop in my bedroom. Um, so I have become, for this, for this one study, you know, one of the people who's 45% users. And then you have people who are coding in Python and Java and SAS and stuff like that, and these are all decreasing in popularity. We know that this is why they're decreasing in popularity, right? As a school, like we're facing a lot of things that are going on. And plus, the base is $595. You want mix and multi-level, try 895. R can p replace, on many, many levels, all of these programs every single last one of them. And just in case you don't get the zero, R costs you nothing. <laughs> so R is based on what's called GNU philosophy, right? And this is a guy named Richard Stallman who was one of the, the founders of GNU philosophy. And this was him resigning from MIT. Um, and I really like this because it explains why people like me like to go and, and look up people's code in the middle of the night rather than, I don't know, I guess you watch TV, you read a book, I don't know what you do. I read code. So he said, I consider that the golden rule requires if I like a program, I must share it with other people who like it. Software sellers want to divide the users and conquer them, making each user agree not to share with others. I refuse to break solidarity with other users in this way. Power to the people, Richard. I cannot in good conscience sign a non-disclosure agreement or a software license agreement so that I can continue to use computers without dishonor. I love the word dishonor. It's dishonorable. <laughs> I have decided to put together a sufficient body of free software so that I will be able to get along without any software that is not free. This is him resigning from MIT, saying, I will no longer work with you because you want control of my ideas and I want to share them with everybody. I find this very fascinating on some level. So we have that sort of philosophy, right? That we should be sharing with everybody else. That everybody should be learning how to do things and that you can see what other people are doing. Um, so we're, we're kind of a crazy sort of group of people. If you've spent a lot of time with coders, we're a little weird. Um, because we're curious in terms of we want to know how things work. We want to know why they work. We go and open up that code. We're creative. Um, when we want something done, we'll go and figure out how to do it. We're versatile, meaning that if one way doesn't work, we're going to find another way. I'll show you throughout these workshops that if you can't do something one way, there's somebody else has done it, somebody else has a way for you to do it, you kind of have to figure it out. Um, we're communal in that we love to help each other learn new things. So the R community is very um, interactive and helpful with each other, and I'll show you some ways you can access that community. We're self-starters in that we go out and look for answers. Um, I know I had several people who were very confused about RStudio that I'd asked you to download because it's a standalone program, and they were emailing me this weekend. The, after these sort of workshops, what you're going to do is say, what is about RStudio? Why, why isn't this working? And you're going to type in RStudio right, <laughs> into the internet. And the first thing it's going to pull up is RStudio.org. Right? 
So you're going to be sort of a self-starter in that way. And I'm going to show you a lot of resources that you can access and things like that. Because otherwise, the Norton School is going to have to find a way to duplicate me from answering all your questions. We're cutting edge people. We like feeling sassy. We like feeling smarter than everybody else. We really do. Um, and we love learning new things. I mean, I'm all about always continually learning. And I like to say that we're freedom fighters, right? We want everybody to be able to use things. We want everybody to have the freedom to write their own programs. We want everybody to be able to open the black box and look, in, look inside. Um, and we think that everybody should love code. So you're going to be an R user, which means you're going to be all of these things. So Cat's number one rule is always don't panic, right? <laughs> Do not panic. Never panic. People start to panic when they're looking at R's. I'm going to show you different ways that you can learn things um, on your own and you can try things out without being completely terrified. So throughout today, we're going to be doing things the hard way. And then at the end, I'm going to show you the easy way. So my daughter's in calculus right now, and it's kind of like watching her go through calculus, right? First, you learned that really long formula. Remember the f of x, f of x plus h, and it all got really crazy, and you were like, what's going on? And then you learned the derivative shortcuts, and like you never go back. I'm going to show you ways for the derivative shortcuts, OK, so that people who are just doing this can just go out and do it. Um, so I call it the R revolution. I know when I first started using R, probably like 7, 8, nine years ago, whatever it was, um, people would look at me and be like, why are you using this crazy program? And I would say it's the only thing that I know that can do everything I want it to, or I can make it do what I want it to. So <coughs> we have a few steps to just being able to get ready to go into it. Mostly I put this on here for some of our folk who can't be here today, but are going to be here next time, because most of you guys have already done this, right? So is there anybody who does not have R installed on their computer? Are we okay? I have R, but you know, I tried to get R Studio and it wouldn't let me. It's the only one that couldn't actually um, install. That's okay. I'll show you R Studio and I'll help you download it later. It's not essential for what we're doing today. R Studio, I know that people were a little bit confused. It runs as a separate standalone program, like I said. And what it does is, um, and I'll show you a little bit of it, similar to SAS. You know how SAS does um, different colors in their code? that kind of help you figure out, like, is this a comment? Is this a command? Is this R Studio does that, and it sort of keeps things together for you. Um, so if you're running a lot of different projects, it can, it can help keep you organized in a lot of ways and keep track of things. Um, it doesn't do anything that R can't do in terms of if you know how to call stuff up in R, you can get it. But for people who are writing code and see it to be a little bit confusing, um, R Studio can help. The real big thing that you guys will want to start off with is R Commander, and I'll show you R Commander today. So, so everybody has some version of R. Excellent. Um, so let's look at R. So this is part of the, you know, we are all learning. Control. Why isn't this going? So we're going to go to statmethods.net. It's one of the resources that I sent you guys, right? Because part of what we're doing is being self-starters. So this is a, a page um, called Quick R. And what it does is tries to help reduce the learning curve for people to be using R, right? This is the, the idea of the person who put this site together for you. So somewhere in that, one of those first things that I sent you, like the program description packages, this was part of the help file. Like, I need help. What do I do? One of the things is to look at Quick R, right? And so there's a thing over here that says the R interface, which sounds really interesting to us because we're talking about what does R even look like, right? So he goes through, like, what's a console? What comes up? What, how is this working? Things like that. So it's a way to sort of poke around um, a lot of the the things on this site are really interesting. So um, especially in terms of you're, you know, you're sitting there just like, all I want is a mean. How can I get a mean? You go to the stats subsection, and you can poke around. So you can do this within books. Um, there are a lot of R books out there. I gave you a list of four R books that I thought were, were kind of um, important in terms of people who are important in the language that wrote them, um, and because they wrote some packages that are used a lot, a lot, a lot. But on the other hand, most R users are online people. 
you know, there's so many sites, there are so many blogs, it can be really overwhelming. So I tried to give you also some resources of places you can go to look up answers that are better than like, I'm just gonna type in Google R. <laughs> just like watch what happens and like, this is all craziness. So there are certain places that people have put together that um, seem to be a little bit more together, people know what they're doing, they're a little bit more organized and this is one of them. Right, so you can poke around on that. But we're going to pull up the program. So when R comes up, if we just click on your R, when R comes up, you have this, this sort of like bigger window. You have something called a console, right? A console, um, if you think about how this works in SAS and SPSS, this is like where you put your output. Um, and it's similar to SPSS in that it prints your code as it's doing your output. This is called the command line. So I can actually write things directly to this line. Right? I don't necessarily have to pull up a script, write script code, save the script, run the script. I don't have to do any of that. If there's something quick that I want to do, then I can do it right here. So we'll do something else quick right now. This is called help.start. So we type in help.start, beginning and end parentheses. If I wanted to search for something specific, I'd put a word in here, like in quotations. Like if I wanted to search for um, our commander or if I wanted to search for multi-level, if I wanted to search for something like that. If I just do help.start, it automatically pulls up a site that's actually your site, even though you don't know it's your site, right? So this looks just sort of general. This is an important thing that the R core group has put together an introduction to R. It's really, really helpful. Um, I don't think that any of you all anytime soon will be writing R extensions, you can ignore it. Our data import and export, that's what we're going to be going over today, is how do, we, how do we get data in, because it's always the real trick, right? Can I even get my data into this program? Et cetera, et cetera. When I click on packages, these are only the packages <coughs> that are actually installed on my computer. That's why I said it's your site, you just don't know that it is, right? So these are the names of the packages I have installed on my computer. So this was another way, aside from typing packages with the parentheses that I told you guys that you could go and um, figure out what packages you have on your computer. The cool thing is that mix I used a lot. I have used a lot, a lot. Um, and it shows you all the documentation. So these are all the functions, and we'll go over that, that you can do in Debmix, right? Debmix is a way to do hidden Markov models, latent mixture modeling, and stuff like that. Um, so I've used it a lot, but it's a pretty cool program, but it's just, it, it, know, it goes and senses what packages are installed on my computer and pulls up the things that are really relevant to me. Um, so when you're looking for manuals, you don't have to go, you can always go to the R project site, then go to the CRAN, and then go and find the package and click on it and search by name and stuff like that. Or you can just help that start. Like here's your packages, there's your documentation. Um, it's an easy way to keep track of things. <coughs> so that's one of the things that happens in terms of we have a command line that we can do things on. Um, it even tells you like, if nothing happens, try this. You know, it's, I mean, it's, it's very sweet. Sometimes the, the error codes for R will be a little strange. We'll see a couple of them today and a couple of weird things where you're like, whoa, what's going on? Um, but this tells you, you know, what you need. And it even tells you right here on the very first thing when you pull up R, try help.start, right? <laughs> it's been helpful, like try help.start. Um, it's a very useful place. All the, all the cool kids are doing it. So. The other thing that we have, we go up to file and we can say new script. This is syntax. It's the place where you, where you write code, right? Um, it's, it's something like the, the script that I sent you, it's the same thing as code, same thing, as, it's just the same thing. So you write your code in here and then you can pull it up later. One of the things that you can do and I'm thinking specifically of our poor SPSS users. So when you're doing SPSS, you know, sometimes you do like the pointy clicky thing and then you want to send your code to somebody later and you can go back into the output and you can like copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. Have you done this? I mean, I've done this. Um, R has a really simple thing 
called history. So these are the things that I've actually typed. If I had more code written here, it just created a script file for me of everything that I have ever typed on a command line. This will include all your screw ups. It will include all the things that didn't work. So you might have to go back and like clear out some of the stuff that didn't work. But at the very end, if you're like, okay, I finally got this to work. Now do I have to go? So you can type on the command line and get what you want later, if that makes any sense, right? I find that to be really, really convenient. <coughs> You can also save your history um, with the point and clicky part. So if I'm over here and I go file, I can save my history. I can load a previous history, um, things like that. When you save your history, I would just save it. I would save it as script. I mean, I wouldn't save it as a history. Um, the other thing that we have is a workspace, right? And you'll hear workspaces a lot. So this right now is my workspace. If I had, you know, like in my office, I get shelves of books and stuff like that. If I pull something off the shelf and I put it down here, it's in my workspace. If I write something down here, this is in my workspace. So now I've created this whole little PowerPoint thing and I want to save it for later and I want to save this and that and I want it all in one big thing. All my objects, all my stuff, that's my workspace. So you can save the way this looks. Imagine if you could do this physically in your office, right? You have one project. You hit the button and everything lays out the way that it was. Then you can move on to another project. Everything goes away and the new project comes up, right? This would be amazing because I end up having like stuff spread all over my desk. Um, and it's like, this is the whatever section and this is the whatever section, but you just put it away and take it out. So if you are creating objects, if you are reading in data files, if you are all the things that you have done, you can save a workspace and then pull it back out later. It makes your life a little bit easier. <coughs> so those are the, the basic things. Um, the workspace does not save your scripts, right? It's saving the objects. So it's not saving the writing that you did down here. It's saving the end result. So if you want to save your script, if you want to save your code, you're, wor you're working on history, right? That's what you want. That's the only, the, the only sort of like tippy thing um, in terms of where we are. So that's what we have. We have scripts, we have consoles, we have history, we have workspaces. That's really what we're, what we're working with. Um, let's see. I'm gonna make sure that my phone is off because that was a little crazy. So we are going to um, set a working directory, which I know some of you were trying to do. So when I'm in R, When I'm in R and I go to my command line, I can say, I want you at the very beginning to go into this file, right? Everything's going to be in this one folder. So I usually have working directories for each project. It seems to make life easier. I keep the scripts there, I keep the output there, I keep you know, all my histories and stuff like that. Um, <coughs> all my data files, it just makes my life easier. So at the very beginning of every um, script that I have, I set a working directory because then I don't have to type this file path anymore. It looks from a local directory. Does this seem familiar to some of you guys from other programs? So this is a way to sort of set your local directory. So I'm set a working directory, and then for me, this is what I have right now. Right? Now the thing to note is that um, in R, if you copy and paste in Windows, Right, you're going to end up with backslashes. In R, you don't want backslashes. You want forward slashes. So if you copy and paste from something, if you copy and paste like the properties, you know, if you go and say like, oh, what are the properties? They're going to be like this. You have to switch them so they're like this, or else it'll give you really, really strange error messages. So here, it's now set my working directory. It's looking exactly in the folder that I've been in for everything that I want, and I don't have to do that again. So for you guys, set a working directory in whatever folder. So if you've, if you've downloaded all those data sets and you've put them in a folder, um, then give it a shot. I'm going to show you what happens with backslash. It's like, oh, what's going on? I don't even know what this is. You know, it gives you these really weird error terms that don't tell you, cat, just turn it around. Um, but that's why it's yelling at me, because I just switched this one. 
So it'll give you some strange error message. Are we supposed to say that we're doing it or not? I mean, because I just tried and got an error message, but not that one. Do you have a folder called our workshop there? Uh, Why is it telling I, you you cannot change working directory? I don't know. But I have a, a folder called R, but not on the desktop, I guess, on my that, Yeah, you need to go to wherever, wherever it is for you. So where's your folder called R? Where are your files? It's, um, shoot, right here. Okay. There are your files. So you probably want, I would, I would right click on this. On, on which one? On uh, any one. Okay. Just right click and hit properties. And then this is your thing, right? So copy that. And then change the backslash. And then change the backslashes to forward slashes. Yep. How are working directories going? Does everybody have one? Has anybody got one of these weird errors like Haley got? You can do spaces either. Spaces. No, you can do spaces. Oh, oh because you have that. Okay. You can do spaces. So, so what, whatever it is for you, wherever, whatever folder you've downloaded all that stuff to, I assume you put it someplace that's, that can be found and or conveniently located. Yeah, it doesn't really give you any feedback. You just have to assume that it actually happened. That's okay. If you hit enter and nothing happens, that means you now have a working directory. <laughs> like, why would you do this to me? Yeah, it's when, it's when things come back to you that you're like, oh no, bad stuff has happened. When you look at your history, I got to see all my mistakes. Yeah, so if... Kaylee just did an experiment and typed history just to see what would come up and she got to see all the different times she was trying to set the working directory and it didn't work. Um, I've even used that like when I'm when I'm troubleshooting stuff or I'm trying to like run a model and I can't figure out why it's working I use the history and then I'll go back and annotate it. So annotation in R is the uh, numbers sign. You know if I want to if I want to write something and I'll go back and annotate it and say this is why this didn't work. So this is why I tried this next. So it depends on what kind of complex problem I'm working on. But you know how like you mess up and you're like, oh, I need to remember not to do that again. I write it down to myself and say, this is why you don't want to do this again. You know? So I actually, I actually use the, I can see every mistake I ever made um, to, my own, to my own purposes and advantages. Okay. Yes. Do you have a, your, Kaylee just did this. So you have a folder where you've saved everything. Yeah, Okay, go into that folder. Open up that folder. Right click on this. Right click there? Yeah, sure. Go to properties. Ah, uh, I need my name. You need all that in there, yep. But this way. Right, but that way. So you can copy and paste that. That's normally what I do, and then I go back and change the slashes. Sure. Yep. Um, I would c copy it. Control A. Okay. Control. And then. And then go to file. <laughs> That's okay. New script. I'll put it in a script. Paste it. Yep. It's sort of like looking at, at an output thing. So you can't you can't change what you've already done. You can't change your history. But you just I just drop it in a script file. And it makes my life easier. OK, so next thing is packages, right? And I think that most of you had done this too, but I put it all on here um, in order for us to be able to send this to other people and have it make some sense to them. So is there anybody who has not installed their packages? I think we had one. She's like, oh, no. Um, there is, do you have the script that I sent you? Okay. Yay, Ashley. She is communal and sherry because she is now an R user. Okay. Um, so that, that's good news. So what, what, what you can do is in that file, there's something that has install packages. I'll show you one of them, but, but you can just run this script after you set a CRAN. So we're going to talk about that for a minute. 
Um, when you guys go into R and you want it to go do something, you're going to the CRAN, right? You learn this a little bit from trying to download things. So the Comprehensive R Archive Network is a series of servers across the world that hold R. So it, it, they're mirror sites. I don't know if that makes sense to a lot of you, but like when something gets uploaded to the new like rproject.org, it goes out to all the servers across the world, right? So you want to go to a server that's close to you. You don't want to be like, I'm going to go to China and get the R package. You know, I mean, you can because you can, but um, but you have to choose a mirror site because otherwise there's so much traffic that like one server would not be able to keep up with all the traffic from R. There's a lot of traffic on R. So. R is usually helpful in this way in that if I go here and I go to packages and I say I want to install a package, it's like, Kat, you don't even have a CRAN, right? So this thing comes up and says choose a CRAN mirror. That's all it means. Um, so you go down, you scroll down, you say, I usually go to California because it seems close. And I say Berkeley or UCLA is one of these. <coughs> and then it comes up and says what packages? Right? One of the things that you do not want to do when you are initially downloading R, there's actually an option that says install all packages. There are over 3,000 mm -hmm. packages right now. So these are people like me who go and write their own functions. They write their own code. They write their own add-ons. I actually have my own cat package that I would never upload because it's just notes for me on things that I do a lot. Um, but I'm one of those people, you know? So you don't want 3,000, I mean, you, you don't have enough computer for 3,000 packages, nor will you ever use 3,000 packages. But people just write their own functions to do anything that they want. And then they upload it to R, they share it with their labs, they share it to do you know, specialized stuff. I mean, it's, it's crazy, right? So one of the things I know that comes up with people with R is like, you know, we don't know what people are doing. We don't know who these people are. Like, like people are just writing code. It could be anybody. They could, they could download and take over your computer. So I'm going to give you a, a couple of little secrets. First of all, I hope that all of you know that previous versions of SPSS MVA, the missing value analysis, the algorithm was wrong. It actually wasn't doing the right estimations for multiple imputation, just so you know. But they put it out anyway, right? And charged you how much money for it. So we can start there. We can go to the fact that I know the woman who wrote PROC LTA for SAS. Do you know what she had to go through before it got added to the program in terms of double checking her work? Mm -hmm. Nothing. She was shocked. She was like, what, what do you mean? Like, we need beta testers. We need to make sure, you know, we need people doing simulations. They were like, no, I'm sure it's right. You know, you're the LTA woman, just do it. So, I mean, this is crazy. So there's this assumption that if we pay all this money that there's this sort of quality check, right? Because SAS is gonna do the right thing or SPSS is gonna do the right thing. Um, the inmates are running the asylum. You know, nobody knows what's going on. As opposed to, if I want to know what is this person doing, I can pull it up, you can pull it up, anybody can pull up exactly how they've written their code and see what they're doing. I don't have to guess at what they're doing. I know exactly what they're doing. When I use debt mix, Ingmar Visser, who wrote it, is a bud of mine, and I used his depth mix for a lot. He, his lab uses depth mix. It's the Markov model thing. Um, and I wanted it to do certain things. So I'd pull up what he'd done, and I'd been like, Ingmar, right here, can you add something that does, you know, and just write him an email. He'd be like, sure, cat. And he'd fix it and upload it, you know, and then I'd just download it. So if I wanted his program to do things that it wasn't doing because he wants people to play with his package and we just love doing stuff like this, he fixed it for me. He did whatever I wanted him to. You know, I mean, can you seriously imagine doing that with SAS, like writing to them and being like, could you just do this little quirk for me? And then being like, no, I absolutely cannot. <coughs> but one of the things I'm going to show you guys is um, packages that are used a lot by people and have been written by people who know their stuff. Um, a lot of the things that when I, when I wrote that list of packages for you guys, you'll see next to it, I wrote who it was written by so that you understand that this is not, you know, just Joe Schmo, the guy who wrote Proc Logistic, wrote packages for R. You know, Schaefer, the missing value Schaefer, wrote a multiple imputation program for R. So these aren't, this isn't just Joe Schmo sitting in his underwear, like, I mean, he might be in his underwear, but <laughs> we don't want to know. Um, 
but you know, I mean, it's, it's anybody, anybody can do this, but there's lots of really smart people that you are already using their programs and their subroutines and other programs you're using who have since joined the art revolution and are writing their own stuff. They send out like notifications when they change something, like the change that you have, mm -hmm. they send out notifications. Yeah, because it gets uploaded into the mirror. So it'll say like when, what's the latest version, stuff like that, it gets uploaded into the mirror. So like if you're surprised that you do the analysis again, it may come out slightly different. Right, and it should be, it should be correct. Yeah. Like you do want to, when there, when there are updates, you do want to run the analyses again. Normally, um, I've noted on things like when some of the packages are pretty buggy, like there's stuff that like has to be worked out and it's sort of like, uh, you know, like you get a lot of error terms, it's not really doing quite what you want. Um, you know, and when the packages are buggy, like normally people, either they're working on them or they've abandoned them. You can sort of go back and look at the, um, the history of when the package was messed with to see like whether or not the person is actively working on this program anymore. And you can always write to them. Their email address, the person who wrote the pro program, their email addresses are up on R. They're up on the CRAN. They're in that information on your packages, right? So you can just write to them and be like, are you still actively working on this package? I have some questions. But before you do that, you're going to go and look yourself in some of the Stack Overflow and online and search for this package and see what other people have said. Because if they've asked and like, answered that question in public in one of these like, major spaces and you start emailing them and being like, help me, help me, they're gonna be like, I don't wanna play with you because I don't have time. Does that make sense? So part of it's like being active yourself, but then like if you've poked around for an hour and you're like, I've been searching for this and I can't find an answer to this, Ask somebody. There's no need to sort of sit there and do it on your own. Okay. I mean, so yeah. where we're probably going to come across those like very cutting edge stuff is not if we want to go out and do a regression analysis. Like mm. regression, mm -mm. Right? Mm -mm. Um, it's like you're doing this technique that you and about 20 other people in the world know about. Yeah. Yeah, it's because I do, I do per yeah. The Noel made a point that um, when you have these questions where it's like, I need to contact the, the author, it's not going to be, I'm doing a linear regression. Trust that some, some site out there shows you how to do a linear regression. The thing that I was working with Ingmar on was hidden Markov models, time series analysis, how far can we push stuff, and you know, I mean, I'm one of those crazy people. So it's like a very specialized program that I think Ingmar's lab was using, and we were using, and maybe a couple other people. So we were trying to help him you know, make sure that his program was accessible as possible um, and that it can be used for like a wide variety of things. So he, he used it for linguistics and we used it for mother infant soothing, which was, you know, the nature of statistics that it can be used for various and sundry things. Yeah. So, yes. Can I, can I back up a yes. Okay. So how do you know if you set your um, directory correctly? Like in SAS, for example, like you input your, you input your file and then your library there there it, it because it doesn't tell you anything otherwise it would give you an error okay. if okay. if you were trying to go to some folder that didn't exist it would be like this folder does not exist yeah I think you can point and click to set a working directory on yeah, Mac users. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Ma the Mac so version of R is really, really similar to the Windows version, except there's a little bit more point and click capability within the base program itself. Okay. So for, for Mac users, you can point and click and set the working directory. Point and click. Okay, and how mm -hmm. would you do that if you were doing this? You would just go like files? I don't, I, don't, I don't think that us Windows users can do that. Oh, I don't think I we're that cool. Kind of Mac do that. Okay. Wait, change directory. Oh, File, change directory. We do have point and click. So I can say, go to my computer. How do I get to my desktop from here? This is not my computer. So I'd have to go to users. I'm here. I'm here. And I'm here. So I'd say, OK. So now it just did it. So I just set the same working directory. Okay. I'm, 
I'm used to writing code for everything. Because then what you end up doing, rather than having to remember to do that every time, is you can be like, I want to be where I was, open up a script file, run it. So this is at the top of like all my scripts, right? Is some sort of a file path that's just like, just go to where I want you to. Mm -hmm. Other questions? All right. But I'm sorry, can I ask one more question? Yes, ma'am. So, so here, like, there's different colors, right? There's the red and then the blue. Those colors are meaningful. Like, red is your command language, and then blue is errors, or not? Blue, blue is sort of like a feedback. It's just feedback. So yeah. it's not necessarily an error. So if you get blue, right. you shouldn't assume it's an error. It's right. Feedback. Right. Our studio has different colors for this is an error, okay. this is a command, this is a... This is an object, things like that. That's why people who write code like our studio, okay. right? Because you're, you have some sort of a, a clue. This is, I'm putting it in. This is, this is what's coming out. Okay. Red and blue, only colors in this main console, um, which will kind of drive you a little nuts sometimes. Right? OK. So we've installed our packages. Um, I do have nerd notes. So when you see me write things, because I'll do this a lot, like install packages foo, Foo means anything, like pick a name of a package and type it in there. Um, foo's a coder thing, and it's shorthand for foobar. If you don't know what that's shorthand for, I will tell you when I'm not being recorded. Um, and that's possibly because most of the things that we get are pretty foobar. So <laughs> the packages that we are using them this time around for the, all the fall workshops are listed right here. Um, there are other ones that you can surely download and play with. There are like, you know, thousands of them. Um, if you type library, open in parentheses, it pulls up the list of every package that you've done. You can also go to the help.start to get to the documentation for each package that you've loaded. But if you want to know what's installed, the trick is, right, that RStudio is a standalone program. It will not be listed in this. Um, so don't, don't get terribly confused. You have to have R in order to use RStudio. But RStudio opens up by itself. So <coughs> this is my little thing down here because Th this, it looks like this, like this is the regular R and this is R Studio because it looks fancier. So when I pull that up, it's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking a little more. There we go. This is our way to, to keep organized, right? So we still have the command line here. This looks pretty familiar. Um, it also helps you load your workspace. It shows you your history as you're doing it which can be helpful. Um, if you pull up script files, there'll be another thing that shows script over here. So it's a way to like click between and keep your little windows organized. Um, and it also has fun and fancy stuff. So I'll show you, I'll show you some code in here like a little bit later. Um, it also keeps like, these are where my files are. These are where plots that I've made and graphs. Um, and that'll be one of the cool things we do in the spring. One of the reasons that, that people like using R and love using R is there are ways within R to create those publication style tables through, through a package that somebody's written in APA style. You know how you've like, you try to line up the little zeros and you're like, why, why, this is very expensive for me to do this. Like, why am I doing this? This is like the priciest table redo ever. Um, there are ways that you can just use a package to do that. They make really, really, really pretty graphs. Lots of people do really cool graphs in R. Um, so, and they're all publication quality. So it's one of those things, if you learn how to use it, like I don't know about you, but I hate SPSS graphs. I find SAS graphs to be extraordinarily confusing and like not really that simple to, to put together and sometimes not publication output. I love using R for graphs. I really do. I think it's amazing. And it shows you, you know, what packages you have on your system. And then just in case you don't know, there's always help, right? So that's, that's sort of what um, R does, R Studio does for you. It's not R Commander, which, who, who's an SPSS user in here? Who's willing to admit it? You guys are going to love this later on. You're going to love it. And you're going to be mad at me for making you go a long way. All right. So, all right. Does everybody ha has everybody downloaded their data sets? Because we're going to load the form package and get data in. Because that's really the, the trick, right? Um, SAS finally got like a little bit better on like, wow, I can actually look at my data set yet now. Um, but 
getting data into SAS to me is always like the biggest pain. And once you get it there, you feel like you've accomplished something. Like you want to like run down the hallway and be like, it loaded, it loaded, you don't know, it's right. Um, so our, you know, a, a very smart person said, I want to be able to just go to SAS, go to SPSS, and take these data sets and pull them into R, and I want it to recognize what they're doing. So if um, some of the older folks in the room used to use stat transfer, does anybody use stat transfer? It's like stat transfer, right? I want to go from this program to another program, make it happen so it's the right format, so it doesn't mess around with me. But even with stat transfer, I could never get things right for SAS. I'm like, this, this whole program is killing me. I'm just getting my data in. So one of the packages that you downloaded was called the foreign package. In other words, you want to read in data sets that are foreign to R, right? So a package is like a book on your shelf, right? And I want to go use that package, so I walk over and grab it off the shelf. So from my library, I want to go get the foreign package. It's like go to my library and pull down this package. This is a nerd note, but you will annoy R people if you call it the foreign library. It's not the foreign library. It's like, it's like calling it the Moby Dick library. Like Moby Dick's a book that's in my library. You know, it's very, it makes us very upset. Um, and one of the biggest critiques of one of the books that I actually sent to you guys is like one of those things that people use, like it, that drives the R people nuts, is everybody has read this book, but he uses the word library for package. And it drives everyone insane. Like, like you'll like be on listservs and people are like, never read that book. I can't believe he uses that term. But other than that, the book is fine. But <laughs> the coders get really mad. Um, so just to not anger the R people when you're asking them questions, please use the word package. It makes us happier. Does that make sense? So we go into here, and we're going back into R. And I'm just going to say library foreign. And it tells me nothing, which means I did it right. Right? That's the creepy part. It's like, did that work? Yes, it did. You just don't know that it worked. Um, so now I have gone and gotten this book off the shelf which means that I can do all the things within this book, all the functions that were written. So I told you we'd talk a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about that. Here is the PDF that is the documentation for the foreign package. No, I want you to just open. Yes, fine. OK. So each pr package has documentation that's like this. All the documentation looks the same. This is good news, right? Because that means when you're going from, you know, Joe Schmo wrote this and Jill Schmo wrote that, they look the same so you know how to locate things once you get used to this. So these are sort of the reference manuals for each program. Where do you find this? Um, it will be on, like, if you go to help.start and then go to your packages, you can download. It's called, like, the manual okay, PDF. So it's on the help.start. Mm-hmm. So every, everything will have something like this. It'll also have just, like this will be interactive and online too as well. Um, I prefer to do PDFs. I actually um, annotate my PDFs and then I upload them to Zotero, which is another program that I wrote to you about. Um, another freeware program at the bottom of the you had me at free part. Um, that functions like EndNote, only you can share it with other people. So like when I make notes on like, oh, I, I did this in combination with that and I wrote this code, I can access this PDF with all of my notes from any computer anywhere. And I can send it to other people. Um, and I can reference it as well. So all of them look the same. The foreign package, they're telling you the last release was May 23rd, 2012. This is good because it means that the developer is still working on it, right? That means that they're still being responsive. They haven't abandoned it and moved on to other projects. Um, yes? I'm having trouble finding the PDF. So I was able to find my foreign package, and I clicked on it for documentation. And I just, I'm not finding the PDF under documentation. We need to. Uh, the other thing that we can do, the other thing that we can do if that's not working, because we're all about try something else, is go to ourproject.org or go to your CRAN. Um, here, we're going to go to the CRAN, we're going to go to UCLA, 
or Berkeley, Berkeley Works, and go to Packages. I know that in our studio it, it shows up much better for you. Sorted by name is fine. Next. So if I go to the foreign package on, on the crayon, do you see how it, it comes up and it looks like this, right? This reference manual right here, you're like, oh, this is very, very terrifying. No, this is what you want, the PDF one. You're going to go to ourproject.org. You're going to go to the crayon. And I have the Berkeley site just tagged in my in my regular so computer. So it's not going to show up on what you're calling like our site. I think so it. I think it does. But it, but it would be something that I would have to go to the Our Project's website to try to find that. Yeah. Because I have a .txt, but that's really confusing to look at. Yeah, I mean this is this is showing you the same thing, in um, in HTML, essentially. Okay. But what? But if you want the PDF PDF, because okay. I think this is just like the HTML part, then I think you have to go back to download this. Okay. It's the same thing, though. Right. But if you want to annotate it and write all over it and print it out and have it all in one place or do whatever, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what R not slash project is. Well, what is it getting you to? She's like, I downloaded something. It might just redirect you. Does it have the crayon? Does it look like R? <laughs> I don't know. Let's let's pull it up and see what she sees. <laughs> Oh, no, I don't know what this is. <laughs> okay, no, don't do that. Go to r slash project. I was wondering where Sue was up here. I was like, what is she doing? R, r hyphen, hyphen, project. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with the flowers. Yeah, but that, well, it says r program and like related searches, but I don't know if you click on that, if it's gonna like put a bot on your system. So I just, yeah. No, r hyphen project dot org. Don't everyone type it because it'll show up higher on Google. <laughs> I, know. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's relying on on people like us to hack our systems. Okay. So let me let me show you a little bit of. I mean, we're not going to go entirely through this. I just want to point out some things of what the reference manuals will look like. We're not going to read the reference manual right now. If you don't have it in front of you, that's OK. There is no crisis. Nobody panic. All right. I always go, operate under the philosophy that there is no such thing as a statistical emergency. Um, so when I pull up the documentation, I'm like, what is the foreign package? And it says, what is my goal? I'm going to read and write data stored by Minitap, SAS, SPSS, S, SysStat, blah, 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 blah. So that's what the package does. So reading the descriptions of the packages can tell you what it's supposed to be doing. It's always nice. Um, and those descriptions are also uploaded online for you to, to search through rather nicely. So who developed this? One of the people, this is where you report any bugs if you get stuff that's coming up and you can't figure out like what's going on, um, is the R core team. That's also good news, right? There's a core group of programmers who all they do is mess with the base program to make things work. Um, I like hearing that it is the R core team. One of the things that is fun to do also, if, if you want to go look at the copyright, it will inform you about how like you can never, um, like what you can do with this and that you're pretty much allowed to use anything. It has a lot about GNU philosophy, you know, I mean, it's not the typical copyright, like don't ever share this, but like share this with everyone. So I always think that's very interesting to do. The maintainer is the R core team. So there's, normally this is a person's name um, and their email information. But the core team is doing this. 
So then we have a little index, right? What is our index? And it's also over here. Like what are the functions that we wanted to do? So something that makes a lot of sense for us is we're going to start off by reading in an SPSS file, right? So let's go and click over here on read SPSS. And this is what comes up. It takes you directly to read SPSS. And they will all look the same. So functions are all presented like this in every reference manual. This is standardized, um, which is really, really much more useful than you can possibly imagine. <coughs> so, yes. That's okay. So I've gotten up to maybe other people as well. I have never the PDF Right there. It's right there. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I also have a picture of this is also in the PowerPoint. So if you have that, I, I took a picture of this. Because I wanted to go through at least one of these so you guys learn how to read these reference manuals so you're not feeling completely lost. Right? <laughs> so this is the function. The function is read.spss. Right? That's what I want it to do. And it tells you, what does the function do? It reads an SPSS data file. That's kind of like self-explanatory. Um, so it's telling you, you know, and then it, it comes in with all these scary things. So there's a little usage thing, right? And that is telling you, what is the specification? What does it look like? What are the defaults? Things like that. So here's an important thing to note. This that does not have an equal sign. You see how this has an equal sign? Can people see this? <coughs> Make this a little better. This thing that says file and then there's a comma, there's no equal sign there. That means you have to put that in. There's no default. You have to tell it what file you want. Right? That makes sense. There's no default SPSS file that's going to pull up. But things that do not have equal signs are, are things that you have to enter. You don't have a choice. Okay? Everything else has use value labels, true. <laughs> to data frame, false. All of those are the defaults. And then for each of these things, it's then defined here, what does that mean? So what is file? File is the name of your file, <laughs> right? So I mean, that's sort of like really clear. Some of the other ones that you'll read will be like, wait, what's going on? Um, use value labels. So this is, if your variables have value labels, this is important for us in some levels to note, then it will convert those into factors. If you are a person who uses Likert scales, like it's a continuous variable, um, <laughs> um, it becomes, it will read it in as a nominal variable, right? So strongly agree becomes, like if that was a four before, if it has a value label, like an SPSS or something, it reads it in as strongly agree. It does not read it in anymore as four. So th I'll show you ways to go back and forth between that, but there's something to, to note. Right? So if you're the type of person who uses you know, ordinal scales and puts them into things and stuff like that, it no longer thinks it's a number. Right? It's saying this is a factor. So the default for that is yes, it's going to do that. If you don't want it to do that, you have to go change that to false. Right? And I'll show you an example of um, crazy things that, have, that can happen and how to do that in just a minute. So these are the descriptions of everything that's within this. Right? What are the things you need to specify? What do they mean? Um, if you don't know what trim factor mean, names is, you can sit there and say, like, what? So this is like when I take things into factor levels, I'm going to cut off the names so that they don't go on forever and ever and ever and take out the spaces and whatever. You know, it's just like things you can mess around with. Then normally they'll have um, details which which is like special things, or if there's things, you know, SAS, the details go on and on, because SAS is strange. Um, and what they really want, and like other things that you can do, and stuff like that. And then normally they will have, at the end of this, an example, which is also very useful. All the functions will have an example. So they're saying here is the way to do it. Read SPSS, here's my data file name, use value labels equals false. They're saying just type that in and you know, whatever data set and try it. So they'll give you examples. Um, a lot of packages will give you come like the larger ones come with example data sets. Quine, the, the data set we're using is one of those. 
So you get, it got downloaded to my computer with one of those packages, and I'm like, oh, this sounds like a cool one to use. Um, you know, it's just, just a random example data set, and so they'll have data sets like, okay, before you try this on your data, try it on something we know works. And then you can go back and do it with your data kind of thing. Does that make sense? Some people are better at examples than others. Um, some people are better at their reference manuals than others. But always read the reference manual if you're stuck. You know, because I bet that it's some sort of default that you don't know what's going on. Yes? So when these examples are the exact text that we'd be typing into R. Yeah. You can copy and paste it. But doesn't it have one line at a time? No, you, I could copy and just paste everything. It's going to go, it, it will do it faster than you think. <coughs> okay, so these are my things. This is my example. We just went through this. Oh, some of them I didn't know. Some of them are um, have little like interactive vignettes that can be really cool to go through and like example. I mean, it goes on and on and on. People are pretty pretty snazzy about some of their reference manuals. Yes? So in the um, example that was just the double pound and the codes that we can use to make those yourself? Any pound. Any, just one pound. They use double pounds. I mean, people have different, yeah. But a pound sign is like um, an asterisk for which program? I mean, I always have to figure out which, pro which program does the asterisk? SAS. That SAS? What does SPSS do? Yeah, it's just it's the same thing to write comments. You can you can comment your code. All right, so our general command, right, is read SPSS. Because we have set our working directory to where this data set ostensibly is on your computer, right? We don't have to type in a file path for this. We can just type in this. Read SPSS, quine SPSS. But what I want to do is assign this to an object. Let me try it without, and I'll show you. Oh, it's unhappy because it wants me to do dot save. No? <laughs> right? It's one of those things where when you get this error, have I set my working directory correctly? Uh, it's the name of a data set I sent you. All right, let's take off the dot save. Ooh. It's like things that work on my laptop that don't work here. Let's try this again. Which might have something to do with the transferring over. Let me take this off. There we go. All right, it didn't like my dot save for some reason, so I took the dot. Yeah, I, I just did it. I took the dot save off of my um, my file name because I think it was actually dot save dot save. Um, if it if if doing the other thing doesn't work, then you can do that. If you get something that comes up and you're like, what? That means you've done it right, right? And I'll show you what we think is wrong with this and how we're going to fix it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what I did, I, for my system, I didn't have to do this before, but I went and took the .sav off this name, and for some reason that worked. Um, I, should, I would try altering your name first just to make sure that something funky didn't happen like it happened with me. So here's the, it's under, it's under C, here it is, and I copied the name so I didn't misspell it. And right? that's, that's your working directory that you set, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, that's a C. Oh, no, it's not, it's not my working directory. But Jen got it to work. So I did read so SVSLs. I don't know if that's what you have to do. I would ask. All right, try adding dot .save on that. Okay. I, I realized that I, I didn't tell you guys something that's going to save you a lot of time. So, if you hit, if, 
That didn't work? No, it's okay, but keep going. I'll listen. Sure? Okay. And I have, I have things printed out that we can let show. If you hit the up arrow on the command line, which I realized that I should have told you guys, it cycles back through everything that you've written before. So you can actually, like, I wanted to retype that but do something different. You can actually just do that, which I realized as she's typing it out again and again that I didn't do. Sorry. So I just cycled back up and said, I'm going to do that again, you know? And I just hit enter. And it's doing the same thing over and over and over again. It's giving me the same data set, like, Kat, what are you doing? <coughs> I wonder, did you set your working directory? And I reset it again. Well, it says no such file or directory, which means it might be mad. There it is. Oh, I added a dot .sav and it worked. For me, I took off a dot .sav and it worked. Like, I don't, you know. It's one of those things that worked incredibly perfectly, and then I transferred computers. No, it's there. This is it. This, this horrid thing, when this comes up, it works. If you scroll back up on this, everybody's like, oh, panic, it doesn't have anything. If I scroll back up, this is all my data. Right, so here's where it started off. I have an ID line. I have an ethnicity. I have other things that go on in this data set. But it looks really weird, right? We're like, where's the freaking matrix? Like, what's going on? Now, this has just been a command line, right? It hasn't been saved as anything. If I leave R and I come back, there's nothing there. They're like, peace out. This does not exist. I want to save this as an object. And this is something to really get used to in R. So that's why we're going to try this again. And hit that up arrow, because then you can get what you just got. And we're going to say, I'm going to assign this a name. And I'm going to call it data set one. And I'm going to put an arrow. Sometimes equal signs will work, but that's like bad R code. Um, I put an arrow saying, take this and put it into an object. That object is called data set one. Does that make sense? Yes. No, I could have done this at the beginning. So I could have done this very thing at the very, very beginning and saved us some um, pain and suffering. Oh no, this, this error is okay. It's still, it, has, it has my data set and I'll show you how you see it. So I type in data set one and I hit return and it brings up my object. This is my object, right? So this is a horrible thing when I scroll back up is my data set. Yes? Um, it's really rudimentary, but That's okay. Okay. The library contains all of your packages. Okay. Packages do things, right? It, it, they contain functions, things that do things. So we have a function called read SPSS. So we are asking it to do something. If we don't save this, essentially we're saving our data set. If we don't give it a place to put our data set, it appears on your screen and it's gone. If I want to do something with that data set, if I want it later, if I want to choose a column in it, if I want to do any of those things, I don't have a data set, right? Because I, if I just do read.spss, it's not saving to anything. So one of the things about R, um, you guys are, by the way, going to kill me at the end of this because I'm going to show you how to point and click and do this, but that's okay. <laughs> you have to start getting used to the code. One of the things to do in R it, to understand about R is that you're doing things to something. So you, you create objects and then you say do something to this object. It's different from what you're used to. But it's, it's, it depends on what program you're used to too. It can be somewhat similar but it's a little bit different. Object oriented code is a little bit different. So we're creating an object and our object is data set one. Data set one still looks ridiculous. 
right? Like, if you saw this, like, you're like, where is the matrix? Like, what is going on? Like, I don't even know what this means. R didn't know what you wanted. And if we go back to this, read SPSS, the one thing we can see is that there's a default to data frame equals false. So let's talk about data frames for a minute, because this is, you guys are still going to kill me at the end of this, because our commander will do all this for you automatically, but that's okay. See, this is my, oh my, what is R doing? Like when we're looking at that crazy data set and we're like, this just doesn't even look right. Like, I think I've done something horribly, horribly wrong. So there are different structures that R is dealing with, different, different ways that there is an object, right? There's a, th there's a thing that we're working with. We can have vectors, which most of us will hardly ever have, um, which just think of like one big column of data as a vector, right? This is like, pull back to algebra two, start remembering. You're like, oh, matrix algebra, dissociate. Um, matrices have more, like if you think of more than one vector stacked up on top of each other, right? So like a side by side, when you think of a matrix. Arrays are more than one matrix. So um, a lot of times for us, this is, this is usually longitudinal data, right? You have a bunch of people, a bunch of variables, a bunch of time points. So that would be something that would be an array. Data frames can include things that have names, right? So if you look at our, our weird little data set, it has all those A's and those N's and the ethnicity and things like that, things that aren't numbers. If you had something that was purely number, it would come out much, much prettier. But this is what's wrong, right? Because our default was two data frame equals false. So that's why it's not, it's not pulling up like we want it to. Does that make any sense? Then lists can include things of varying lengths. So if you have, um, if you think about longitudinal data, somebody skips a time point. So this person has, you know, 10 variables. This person only has five of them, things like that. We're going to work a lot with lists later on um, as we do like more complex stuff. So not everything has to be the same, the same length. Yes. When you said read SPSS and then the filing, what was what format was it? Was it like an Excel spreadsheet or where the file was an SPSS file or if it was a SAS file? Then it would read you would do read S S A S and it would read a SAS file. Right. We're going to go through the other the other things in just a minute. So we're going to pull up a whole bunch of we're going to pull up Quine a lot in various formats. So I took the same data set, I pulled it up in SPSS and saved it as an SPSS file. I pulled it up in SAS and saved it as a SAS file and sent it out to you guys. And then said, let's get all of this back into R. I guess right? what I'm saying is, what, what if you never had SAS or SPSS to begin with? And then you want to Like if somebody sent you a, a SPSS file and you don't have SPSS in your computer, mm -hmm. R doesn't care. As long as it's in the SPSS format. No, what I mean is, if you don't have, if you don't, even if you're starting out, you do a study and you have all your data and your Excel, you save it in Excel and then. You, you can put it in Excel, yeah. You can put it in tab delimit. I mean, you can put it in anything that you want, really. Is there a preferred R? I mean, I don't use Excel because I don't like Microsoft, so I use Open Office. <laughs> but <laughs> but people will use Excel. Um, I think the answer is it's very easy to read either a comma separated values file that is yes. save or a tab delimited file. Yeah, and we're going to do that in a minute. Um, so. So we noticed that the two data frame thing was false, right? So now what we need to do is change it to say two da data frame equals true. So it's the same thing we just had, the same data set we just had, although apparently mine doesn't like the SAV, and then two dot data dot frame equals true. So the defaults hold until you go back and specify, I want you to do something different. So when we do that, I'm calling this one data set two. So I just hit up and then I hit up again because it pulled up my old stuff, which I'm sorry I didn't tell you guys about until like much trauma happened. So I'm going to change that to data set two just so I can show us the difference. And I'm going to say two data frame equals true. And I obviously can't type. Hit enter. It's still giving me that same, the, ignore that little error message. And when I type in data set two, I say, I want to see data set two, right? I know I have an object called data set two. I want to see what's in this object. 
this looks so much more familiar. I scroll back up, make sure that everything's okay. We know, we know what this looks like, right? This makes much more sense than like, what on earth is happening? Does that make, does that help? But it's not necessary to change it to data set two, you're just doing that to be having right. data set one, that looks yeah. like old format, and data set two looks like any Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm just wondering, like, this is a warning message, and I call it an error in read as cases, but it, why it's telling me there's an error if it is working? That's what it's well, type in data set two and see what happens. It worked. Okay. Um, I think it doesn't like one of the um, the ways in, in which these are being entered, like the format in which SBSS saved it. But you always want to go back and check your data, right? So I wouldn't just like do data set two and not ask for data set two. I would go back and look at this and say, is this correct? All right, I had six variables. I had 146 people. Is everybody there? Like, are we all, are we all working on this? Yes, Angela. <laughs> I love strange. It gave you nothing, but it went from a person to a plus sign. Oh, yeah. um, it thinks that you're still, it, when it goes to the plus sign, it thinks you're still entering a line of code. Um, so you probably have a parentheses that wasn't closed. Just hit return and it'll yell at you. Uh, I entered something wrong, obviously. You know what, it doesn't like... Oh, I didn't put, I know, I don't have a... Um, it's the quote. Yeah. Well, go go back up and then click your up thing. Oh, what, what? There we go, because that'll pull up that one, right? Okay, so I want this. I didn't, uh, That's okay. so it was this. And keep in mind, so now it's saving as data sets, just so you're learning. Keep in mind that sometimes when you're getting error messages, it's going to be, um, the first thing to check always is capitalization as well. Oh, yes. okay. So, so if that, if that doesn't caps. work, you might have to change true. No, not, I'll no, change true. This one doesn't matter. You're picking true. anything. You might have to change but that. Change but that. try it and see what happens. Yeah, I didn't like it. So. Try true in all caps. It gave you that warning, but I think it's okay. Type in data set two and see what you got. You got there it. it Wonderful, thank you. Yes. Okay, so um, Melissa and I have very uh, We're the same. intense colors going on <laughs> for some reason. Like I've reset. <laughs> this was a lot. It's a lot. Okay. It's like Fourth of July on my computer. Because mm -hmm. um, it's like I've reset the directory, which is where that mm -hmm. SPSS file is, and then I keep typing in, and it's like not. Let's ready. pull up that. Let's pull up. Let's pull this up. Because one of the things I had to do. I know you said right click and then make sure the file name. Let's try it with the dot save here. Although, you know, you'd think it would work up there. Whoa, how'd you do that? That was the, click the up arrow. Oh. That was, I kept, I kept trying to tell you guys, like, please stop typing in things over and over again. It is, it's, it's everything. Oh, you haven't loaded your, it's saying do not find the function. It doesn't mind the package. You didn't load your library, don't you? You need to load f the foreign library. We reset our directory. We didn't load oh, the library. Oh, so we did step one and then switched to step we're, we're, two. We're, I don't, think, I don't know that work. you ever loaded the library because it should still be up even if you reset your working directory. Okay. Now your library's up. Now I can do. Um, now no. you can do what you wanted to do. So library just hit up, foreign? up. No, Johnny. just hit, hit up. Don't, don't type it. Don't type it. Don't type it. Up is the library. Up. There you go. If you hit up twice, you go up to your second line that you just wrote. Okay. If you hit up three times, you go up to the third line that you wrote before that. It's okay. so much faster. There we go. There you go. So you probably want to put that dot save on there and see if that works. Because that's really an error term. Now, I got... Okay, thank you so much. Let's see what happens. Yep, that's the, one, that's the warning you wanted. Type in data set two. <laughs> yeah, type in the name of your object and pull it up. Yes, ma'am. Get my data. S I'm trying to set the data set, and I so I type that right, mm -hmm. and then I hit enter, and it gives me an error. You know, sometimes let's try this. No, 
sometimes. Let's try. See if yours likes this better. That's it. Okay. <laughs> so, so the double quotes or the single quotes yeah. should do the same thing. For her, it wasn't working, so I changed her double quotes to single quotes, and it ran. Sometimes it's like, I don't know, what's your operating system doing? So some of it's how R is op like interacting with different operating systems, whatever else is going on. Um, I know that I have trouble, because sometimes I'll go from smart quotes to straight quotes, and it like depends on what system I'm on, and like whether or not it's recognizing it, and R gives you these really weird errors. <coughs> so then I just go back and like find and replace all quotes with these quotes, and then boom, run it. So some of it's, you guys are all like interactively learning, so you, you are now all our users, because <laughs> you have been troubleshooting, right? Never mind that everybody's gonna burn my office down once we're all done. So one of the things to note, I have right now a data frame. This data frame has different <laughs> columns, right? If I have thousands and thousands and thousands of variables, which sometimes I have data sets that do. I mean, this is going to go on and on. It'll actually print out to here and then start the, on another thing and start, an, and you're just like, this is insane. Like, who's going to look at this? Nobody's going to look at this, right? What I really want to see is what are my responses for whatever variable. So instead of calling up the whole data set, we're going to call up one of the, one of the sub parts of the data set. Right, so one of our variables is named sex with a capital S. That's important because otherwise things won't happen. So if I try it with lowercase s, it says null, which means does not exist. Cat, what are you trying to do? And I'm like, no, run! And then I realize that it's because sex is not the same as sex in R. Not all sex is the same. So when I do that, it tells, it pulls out just, this is the dollar sign. I'm saying pull out the subset variable of this, just this, that's all I want to see. And it prints out every value I have of that. Okay, so this is the way when you enter vectors, when you ask for vectors, this is the way a vector will look, which we'll see a lot more of as we go through these workshops. But if I just want to look at one thing, then I can do that. So let's try another, another pulling, pulling data in thing because we haven't gotten to the real baby, which is SAS, <laughs> as usual. CSVs are really, really easy. This is just the defaults I'm showing you from that manual, right? So the, the default is, yes, there's a header. It's on the first line, which is usually how it is, your variable names. It's separated by commas. Quotes are done like this. Like This is, this is what CSV files look like, comma-separated files. Um, it's really, really easy to save SAS files as CSV files, and in all honesty, if I were a SAS user, that is exactly what I would do. I'm gonna show you the read SAS thing, but there's so many error terms that come up, and bringing SAS files into R, I mean, I've sat there and messed with them for like an hour, being like, I'm gonna get this code right, and they just be like, forget it. Open, save, CSV, <laughs> open again. You know, and it just seems like a little bit easier. Um, you can also save all your SPSS files, as CSV if you want, um, you know, wh whatever. So this is what the default is, but for us, all we're doing is, I, I called it quine comma, which seemed to make sense, dot CSV, read it in. So read dot CSV, quine comma dot CSV, and it should come up. We'll see if it doesn't like my CSV thing or what happened, but this should work. Or it worked on my other computer. So I just wrote, I just typed that read.csv, quine comma.csv, and it instantly printed out that whole thing. I'd want to put that into an object, right, like data set three or something like that, so I would have it for later if it was my data set. Um, but you saw, like, even with SPSS, which should be fairly simple, there were, like, quirky things about extensions. I never run into this with tab delimited. I never run into it with CSV. It's just, like, done. It's really, really simple. It knows, it knew it was a data frame, it put it all together, like it's very pretty, it's in a nice matrix, I'm not sitting there panicking and being like, this looks really weird, what are all these null values? Um, stuff like that. Make sense? Okay. 
So that's actually fairly simple. And tab delimited and text delimited are the same command, the same function that is read.table, right? These run similar to the CSV thing. So I gave you one that says it's called quine tab. I, I use really obscure names, right? And one that's called quine text, like the same thing. And you can run them and show that it will pull them up. But we did, so we've done read.spss, read.table, read.csv. Let me do a read.table. So we had quine text, read.table, just to show you guys how easy that is. If I knew how to type, I may not like my txt. Oh, because I did it like that. Okay. It's like that file doesn't exist because I didn't write it right. Okay, now that I write the file name right, this looks familiar to us too, right? We're at the bottom of that same thing. So that was a cakewalk, right? Read.csv, read.table, like you see how easy and simple this is. But of course, most people have things in SAS or SPSS. Um, I think we called it tab. Same file. I just did the tab delimited one. You know, so it's the same matrix that's coming up over and over and over again. I just wanted you guys have to, to have examples of different things that um, you might be using because this is always the hardest part. SAS. As I have said, I actually was on online messing around with another SAS file and like trying to load it up and make sure that I was going to be able to, to tell you guys things correctly and if there were any tricks and stuff like that. And someone had posted to a site and said, um, you know, I'm having a lot of trouble reading in my SAS files and stuff like that. And one of the R people wrote, you know, they were like, what is with R and SAS? And they had written back, um, it's my understanding that even SAS users have trouble getting SAS into SAS, like SAS files into SAS these days, <laughs> that they can't read their programs because of the 32, 64 bit problem. And it's like things are, things are really crazy with the program. And it's, it's always been like this, right? This has always been like the crazy thing about SAS and disadvantage. So there are, um, if, you, if you must, because you know, you're going to be doing this and you don't want to have to open the program and save it down and stuff like that, and you'd rather have the code. Um, there are things in the foreign library and the foreign package that will read SAS files. So it's a combination of two things. It's called read SSD, read.ssd, and read.export. This happens without you even knowing it. Okay? The hard thing is that I can't show you because there's no SAS on this computer, <laughs> what's going on, but I can tell you what works. So what it does <laughs> is the foreign package creates a SAS code, OK? So read.ssd creates SAS code, goes to SAS, opens it up, executes the code to export your file to read into R. I'm serious. But it does. All, this is what's going on behind the scenes. So this sort of explains why they want different things in terms of what we're putting up here, right? So here's one of the tricks. This was my working directory, right? This is where everything is. So it wants to know first, where is the data file? I can't just, it will not function if I don't put in the working directory again. This is one of those weirdness, right? So if I just said, if I just assume, you know, like everything else, it's like, oh, it knows the working directory. It's just going to go get it. No, no, no. You have to tell it, where is your data file? So that's what this first part is, right? Is the data file path. And it's in quotations. Here's my file path with forward slashes and quotations, comma. So where is my data? This is where my data is. Then it wants to know, what is the name of your data set? The name of our data set is quine.sas. Is there anyone who has SAS on the, their computer? On what they have with them? Mine pulled up. I just typed in read.ssd and I got a bunch of blue. I don't know if it's right. <laughs> but it's like lib name, all files, there's else commands in here, there's st, cat, there's cat with c, a, p, not k, you can list commands in there, there's else statements. 
Yeah, there, there are a million different defaults within this program that you can go back and change. <coughs> there are a few things that you have to have. So when you pull up, like if you go to do the, the foreign library and um, go to read.ssd, these are the different things that it wants, right? So it's telling us we have to give it a library name Section names, this actually is some of the most confuse, confusing documentation I've seen in the foreign package, right? Because when you actually go down into it and you start trying to do it, it's really, really weird. So I went through, I, th I think it's really buggy. The developers think it's really buggy. The developers, when you ask them, you know, when are you going to improve the, um, the SAS read-in, they say just save it as tab delimited. I mean, this is their answer is like, why would you even mess with this? But I know that people want to be able to do it. Um, I think the challenge is, I mean, we're trying to do a lot of R so we don't have to buy SAS. So right. if your SAS license expires, you can't access those files. Yeah. So. yeah, if your SAS license expires and it can't open up SAS, like, if you really are committed to making this change once you guys start working with R and stuff like that, and you're like, you know what, I don't need SAS anymore, take all your files and save them someplace else. Save them as tab delimited. Save them as CSVs. Yeah. Yeah, like you can you can do a, a save as in SAS and save it as a CSV. Okay. Um, and that'll work. Like it you saw it pulls in beautifully. Yes. Just, just the, what is the and maybe you're doing it, the SAS CMV, what is that one referring to? That file path? Is that just where your SAS I'm getting there. Okay, so here is where my data is, right? And I have to specify it again. Even if I already have set my working directory, I have to tell it again. This is where my data is. This is the name of my data. So that's in quotes and then a comma, right? SAS CMD is where is my command line to open SAS? That's what it wants to know. It says, where are you telling me to go to open the SAS file? So what you want to find is this file on your system, right? And for us, normally it's somewhere within program files, then there's a SAS, you click on SAS foundation, then it has a little folder that says 9.32, and I don't stop clicking and going down and searching for it until I get to this. This is what I want. So I'm telling it, the command line to open SAS and execute it is here. Here's what it's called, here's the path file for my computer, right? So I just copy and pasted that and then changed all the backslashes to forward slashes. So that's the basic setup. If you run this code correctly and execute it, it will pull up just like we've seen. I can't, the SAS isn't on this computer, so I can't do it without SAS. But, it, but that's what it's doing, which is why it's sort of important to understand what it's doing. It's like it's executing SAS, it's creating a syntax file, it's creating a temporary folder, you know, um, and temporary syntax, and then it dumps it when it's done. So it's like, how do I get this? Here it is, and now it's done. <coughs> so that's a way to, to pull stuff in as well. Does that make sense-ish? So that's your file path to SAS executable, wherever your executable file is. So uh, if you yes. go back to Haley's earlier mm -hmm. question about like, what package you've been using, it sounds like yeah. what saying too. It sounds like we should just save everything in Sure. Right? Because like, if we don't have SAS, we don't have SPSS, and then it's easy to import them. Right. And I mean, the thing about CSV files is SPSS can read CSV files, uh, SAS can read CSV files, Excel can read CSV uh, files, R can read CSV files. It's one of those universal, you know, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't look as pretty as, um, you know, like, like SPSS can read it, but then it doesn't have, you know, your value labels and all the little things that people like and, you know, it's not cute. Um, so, you know, but I mean, CSV will always work. It'll always work. So now that I'm getting ready to really get you guys very angry at me, we are going to go on the command line here and type in library. capital R, lowercase cmdr, end parentheses, and then hit return.
Just say OK and tell it to load them. It's going to ask you, do you want to install these? You say yes. Okay. So let it run. <coughs> okay. Package. Oh, it's working on it. Oh, it's just still thinking? I think. I don't know. <coughs> <laughs> oh, this is Macintosh stuff. Um, like you quit R and try again. No, 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 no. I, it, it loads for me as like a separate program-ish, not within the same thing. Is there, how do I look? Uh, it would have showed up down here, but there, nothing new came up. So like our studio did it, and it, I yeah. had a win, you know, I had a... Well, now it's thinking about it longer. <laughs> Do, who's our other Mac users? <laughs> I probably don't want to use it anyway, but Yeah, you won't you won't want to use it. You won't find this amusing. This is for SPSS people. Yeah. Yeah. I don't use this at all, but SPSS are going to love this. Let me, let me work on this in just a minute so I can show them and have them poke around while we try to figure out Macintosh. Macs are a little, are a little strange, although our studio actually works better for you than it does for me on Windows. Yeah. This got more features for you than it does for me. Um, so, yes. That's fine. What's your kind of rule of thumb about saying yes to downloading packages? I mean, are you pretty safe downloading packages? Is there ever risks that you know it's a recommended package? I mean, I think the the risks aren't really that somebody is going to like put a bot on your system and take over your computer. The risks are generally. Um, that that everybody's doing packages so if you don't know who's written the package sometimes it's like i don't know that this is really doing what i think it's doing like i do not think this means what you think it means um so similar to like sbss's mba you thought it was actually imputing your data it was not imputing your data correctly but you wouldn't know that do you know what i mean so it's like i don't know like unless you're the kind of person who likes to go and read code that's why i've tried to give you a list of i mean a list of things that are really reliable. A lot of things that you'll see that packages do, and I tried to write this to you guys, but I know I haven't said it yet, is that packages will reverse depends, is what it's called, on other packages. So when I download um, a huge package like our commander, it is going and getting everything it will ever need. Right? So if you don't have it on your system yet, it's going to get it and put it on your system. You can turn that off and tell it no. You could have told it no. Um, I mean, Fox wrote our commander. I think it's really okay. You know, like, I, I think we're pretty good and a lot of people are using this. This is the thing that turns R into SPSS. This is why I said you guys are all going to shoot me, right? No so, because we didn't do it the short way. This is definitely the short way. But I never, I never use our commander. But I know a lot of people who do. Um, so it's really okay to say, like, you can go get that package. Like, a lot of packages use MASS, a lot of packages use RMS, a lot of packages use CAR. So if you don't have CAR on your computer, it's going to go get CAR and put it on your computer because it knows it needs it. And you'll also th see things that'll come up um, with NR that will say things like, this is masked from this program. So if programs, if, if packages have the same name for a function, it it has already made a decision as to, we're only gonna use th the name for this function to mean this, but not this. So like if there's a conflict, it resolves those conflicts and tells you what it is. Like I resolved this conflict by saying that this function doesn't matter. So you should know when you're typing in this function name that this is what it's doing. So um, that rarely happens. Our coders try very deeply to not name functions for other, um, that are the names of other things. People are usually pretty careful about that, but sometimes it happens. So on some level, R is very smart um, in terms of what it's doing. This, for everybody who 
wants to play, because we're not meeting again until September something something, um, this is what you want, right? This is what you're going to play with. This is everybody's new fun toy. So we are going to go to data, import data. You're like, Kat, why would you do this to me, <laughs> right? <laughs> import data. And what it is doing, what you don't know that our commander is about to do, is our commander is opening the foreign package, executing all the things that you just did. So let's try, I want to import my SPSS data set. I'm going to call it data set 6. Now, here's one of those defaults, right? Convert value labels to factor levels. I told you that some of you guys will not want it to do that, um, specifically like when you're using ordinal skills. depends on what you want. So you just say, OK. And it says, oh, look, it's a little window. I'm so used to this. Where is the program? And I say, look in here. There's my file. Now, that is all the code. And it's doing the defaults as well um, that we just did, right, on some level. It is printing it out in a script window for you, which is why this is your new best friend. It is creating script. So this is similar to the way that SPSS Finally, they, they, they turned it so that you just have to do it unless you turn it off. It used to be like you had to turn it on. It was really weird to print that, that code in the output. So in a very similar way, it's spitting it out for you, right, when you're doing your pointy clicky thing. So this can be a really cool way for new people not only to do everything that they need to do that's very basic, but also to start learning the code and figuring out, like, what does this mean? So I told it, I want to call it data set six. And it's doing what we thought, read.spss. It just opened the foreign package and is executing it. You just don't know that it's doing it, but that's what it is doing. Um, so it's doing the, the path, and then it's saying I want this file, use my value labels, to data frame, it already read it and said there are, are words in there, and there are numbers in there, and I think that means she wants a data frame. They already did it. Right? Does that make sense? OK. So now I can go to View Data Set, and it pulls up what you're really used to. Here's my data set. Right? Don't be too mad at me. You have to learn the code, too. OK. So if I want to do statistics, like let's do a t-test, right? We're all used to doing t-tests. So this is a single sample t-test. I am going to pick um, that's not what I wanted. Statistics means oh, independent samples t-test, sorry. I'm going to pick my group. I want a comparison between males and females. Days is actually the number of days they're skipping school, even though you guys don't know that yet. Right, so this is very, very SPSS-y in a lot of ways. I want to know a comparison between males and females. I want to know what days they're picking school. I can change my confidence levels. Um, they're even showing you like the difference is F minus M, so you know which one's going where. Um, you can specify this would be like a one-tailed test as opposed to a two-tailed test and which way you want it to go, all of those things. Tell it whether or not you want to assume equal variances. We're very, very used to this, right? So I run it, and it tells me up in my script window what it did, right? So it opened up a library called rel imp, um, and it, it went to look at the data set. That's where I, I was saying, like, show me my data. But then the next line is where we ran our t-test. So this right here, that's up there. So I did t.test. Right, things are things are named rather obviously. That's a function. So I want R to do something. What do I want R to do? I want it to do this t-test. It's called t.test. I want to predict days that they're skipping school by sex of person. I want it to be two-sided. I want it to be so all of these things that you would be going into manuals for and stuff like that, our commander is going and doing it for you in a point and clicky kind of way. SPSS people are screaming inside with joy right now, aren't you? You're just like, this is amazing. Um, and you can do it on, on different data sets and stuff like that. So that, that not only is a way to do your t-test 
and get the results that you want. Um, it's also a way to do it and then get the code back. So people who are trying to learn this can be really, really useful. Because if you can either sit there and start reading the manuals or you can be like, you know what, I'm just gonna pull this up in R Commander and see what they do. And like, then I'm gonna copy that code into a script file and save it and, and I'm gonna go do fancier things with it or, or things that are more fun. Um, but as you can see, you can do pretty much anything that you can do in SPSS, right? We have summary statistics, including correlations, um, you know, descriptions of data, tests of normality. You can do chi-squares um, with contingency tables. You can do ANOVAs. You can do multi-way ANOVAs, one-way ANOVAs, t-tests. You can do proportion tests. Um, I really like this because this is actually something you can do in Minitab that like I can't, I've never figured out a way to just do it simply in any other program, which is like using summary data to do a proportion test. So like, you guys might find this interesting in terms of, um, what do you call it? You bring a whole bunch of, I just lost my noun, a whole bunch of data sets together. Meta-analysis, meta thank you. I lose my noun sometime and I'm like, what? Um, you can do variance tests like F-tests. You can do Wilcox tests, this is sort of rank order of some. Principal components analysis, factor analysis, cluster analysis, all of those things. Um, linear regressions, linear models, GLM, um, which isn't as fancy as you'd want it to be. Logistic regression, ordinal regression, all those things that we want to do. You can make pretty graphs, which you're also used to, being able to do an SPSS. Um, I actually end up, this is not my system, so I don't have things downloaded. I have things downloaded into our commander actually to do a lot of time series stuff, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. I closed out of my R commander. So go back to regular R. I, no, I am, and then I typed it again, but now it's not popping up. Try closing your R. Closing the whole thing? Sure. Why not? Say no. Well, maybe. Oh, there okay. <sighs> Pull up R, like regular R. Okay. Just type library. Parentheses, capital R, CMDR. Yep. There it is. It came. I don't know what happened, but there you are. All right. So, Ken, you said that you had like time series on your version of this, but. Yeah, this isn't my laptop. Right, so that sounds like you're going to add particulars to our commander. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are some things. Um, there is when you go to Grants of our Connect Power, we're going to go back. We're going to search for RCMDR. It's done a lot of different things um, that are sort of specialized. Most of these it's downloading itself, but like, yikes. I'm not used to this computer. But it, it has all of these, these sort of plug-in plug type things. So there's like a survival analysis thing and teaching demonstrations and stuff like that. There's other things you can load in if they seem really cool to you. And some of the time series packages actually pull back on this. To do, it's normally to do graphing stuff that really likes them. So that would be, you know, if you like it and you want to expand or see what's there, then that's what I would do. Um, so are there other questions? Does this all make sense to you? One of the things that can be really interesting um, for R that's up and coming, I, I have a lot of people who come into my office and they have variables that they want to be continuous variables but are desperately not continuous variables, right? So like Stephen and I do a lot of studies of sexuality of youth. You ask kids how many se like sex partners they've had, you have this stack on zero, and then it goes whew, right? They, there's nobody really out here at like 30 when you're 15. There, maybe, but, but not really, like one or two. You know, and most of the kids are stacked really, really far on zero. And then they go down to one, two, stuff like that. And people are like, what do I do with this? Can I transform it to normal? And I'm like, well, not really. I mean, you can try, but 
you know, you do as many, tra you know, so we run it and like run a transformation. It still doesn't look normal. It still doesn't look normal. And some tests that we have, as you guys know, can handle violations of normality. Some of them really, really can't. Um, and so people are like, well, what do I do? Normally what I've been telling you to do because I don't want to make you cry is um, do a, you know, not never had sex versus had sex and then just take the kids you've had sex and like try and model them and maybe you can transform that because that's a little bit easier to transform and stuff like that. But what it really comes down to is that you don't, you're not going to end up having the same predictors, right? Like this is a, this is a substantive issue. The thing that moves a kid when you have things that are so weird and people get so frustrated, they're like, I should just be able to make it normal. Well, it's not normal. The difference between a kid, the predictors that's going to predict, I haven't had sex versus I've had sex, is different from I've already had sex and I'm going to have sex again. Right? This, that's a very different decision process for youth. And it should be different. So you can actually model different distributions. You don't have to transform it. You can have those different predictors for different distributions. Like, I want to know what predicts something that looks like this. So at some point in time, way back in the day, possibly when you were undergrads, you heard about different distributions, right? And instead, we just treat everything like it's normal, or we want it to be normal. Um, we can actually look at things the way they are and try to predict them the way they are without fancy transformations. Like, does this look like a chi-square distribution? I encourage you to go online and look up different distributions that you've totally forgotten and what they mean and what you might have because that's really what you want to be modeling. I don't want to be modeling this and just change it into normal because it is very, very different for kids. And most of the work that we do is very different. The predictors are different. They should be different. They're logically different. We just get frustrated because we don't have the tools to do something differently. So this would be, for my, my more complicated homework assignment, would be like, start thinking about what you can do with the work that you're doing if you had tools that you didn't have before in easier ways than you didn't have them before. Make sense? So this is our, this is our very beginning. Um, I wanted to show you guys how to get data in and then how to get what you really wanted, but, but really how to get this script, right? Because what you really want to start doing is looking at the script and being like, what are they doing? You know, and then, and then being very curious about it. Because I want you to start in between now and, the, and our next time, you know, pulling in stuff. Run something on it. And it's okay to pull it into our commander. It's fine. Like, do that and see what they're doing. You know, how are they reading things in? What funky things are happening? How do, how do I fix it? What problems am I running into? You know, just see if you can get data open, at least. That's your own own data. Say again? So what are your choices now under a um, You can show like the, what the quantiles would be if it actually was a T distribution. You can do, um, I don't, I'm not sure what you can do within our commander, but for like our intents and purposes, there are other things where you can do like tests, like you know how you have a test of normality? You can have a test of, does this really, is, is this really a chi-square distribution? Yeah. You know, is this really a, um, Bernoulli distribution or something like that. So we, there are other ones that can do that, that, that just make it, this just so much more sense. It's sort of like what we've been waiting for in a simpler way that we can actually share with people as, yeah. as us, you know? Yeah. So this, is this like, I mean, going in here and seeing the t-tests and daily insects, is this like learning the same kind of code that I learned for SAS, but now I'm learning R code? Um, I mean, you can, you can use this depending on what you're trying to do. For the simple stuff, this is fine, right? I mean, nobody's gonna have an estimation problem with a t-test. It's a freaking t-test. Like, it's really like not that complicated. So you don't, I would say don't, you don't have to learn the code for simpler things. The real thing is when you wanna do something that's a little bit more fancy, or you wanna do something that's complex, you know, like, as we're getting into things, it's like, what do I do when I have, um, you know, factors versus, you know, that are predictors versus, you know, continuous variables that are predictors and what they're normal, what they're not, and what goes on. Um, and that's when a lot of the packages start doing <laughs> fancier things that other people, other people have, right? But for, I mean, for the SPSSers in the room who are like dedicated to SPSS and SPSS is your life, this is what you need. This does everything that SPSS does. 
Um, for the people who are like, SPSS doesn't do everything I need, which is why I've been using SAS, <laughs> right? <laughs> then we need, to, we need to learn some more fancy stuff. Yeah. I just been trying to mess around. Like, if I wanted to point and click and run an analysis, and then I just wanted to change the variables and then, like, a different t test, mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out a way that I could just, like, type in the variable names. I can go into the script window. So up to the script window, not. Mm -hmm. And I can just copy that and paste it. And I want, uh, what was one of our other things? F. There it is. I, and then I hit, um, the, the thing that I just hit to run that was Control R. Control R. So if I'm on a line and I want to run that line, I can just hit Control R. And so it just ran it with ethnicity. Yep. And so then, like at the end of this, you know, you want to save different output, you want to save your script, stuff like that in the same way that you would normally do. So you don't have to go back and point and click all over again. Yes? So why is like super basic? Sorry, this is a basic question. How come there's not more variables under the correlations? Like I only have two. But I have a bigger data set. I have days and ID. Like where are the other variables? Because R doesn't want you to do things. This is one of those fun things that you're not supposed to do. So these things that are factors, it will not let you run a correlation on them. It's not, even, it's not even pulling it up. It's like, why would you even try to do that when you're not even supposed to? <laughs> so, yeah. We'll run into that, like, as we do these workshops, we'll run into that a lot, where R will be like, no, I'm not going to do that for you. Or, like, the default will be, you know, something that, that was brought up in our graduate statistics courses, and now we just ignore. And R will be like, no, you can't do that. You're not allowed. So I'm going to search the CRAN because this is one of our. Um, learning, learning styles? No, this is this is one of our learning styles, but this is one of our data sets from R. Oh, okay. So we're going to look up Quine because that's the name of the file, oh, okay. and it's going to tell you there's some vignettes, things like that, blah blah blah. So I think this is probably our thing. Maybe. Yeah, that's not telling us that. So let's try something else. Let's try, question mark. I want it to search, here's another thing. I want it to search the R site, and I want it to search the R site for this word. Double question marks, quotations. This is a lot like one of those, this is also um, listed under that, that help, help thing and the thing I sent you. It's another way to find stuff. So when I do that, when I say, what is Quine, which is, this is something I should have shown you guys, so I'm glad you brought this up. It brings up everything that has the word Quine in it, right? And so I'm looking and I'm like, oh, what is it? Here's our thing, right? So the mass package has the sample data set and the sample data set is Quine. I'm like, oh, that sounds more familiar. And so when I click on that, it tells me what's the data, what's the format, what do all of these things mean. So all their sample data sets that are uploaded into the R system will have descriptions of what the variables are, what they mean, stuff like that. It's just freely available data that people have uploaded to do examples for people. But that's something to note is that when you do that double quotation mark, you're doing a, a search term. Um, if I want to search for something like let's say that I just did this. I'm actually looking for a function and it's getting confused. Oh no, it actually did it. I'm amazed. Normally it starts getting upset. Um, let's do one that I know won't come up. Oh, it comes lock. So I'll do standard deviation. So I just searched for the term standard deviation and I think I'm searching for the term standard deviation. And I'm actually not. It wants something that's like an actual, this is sort of like searching an index with a single quotation mark, as opposed to search for this search term in everything, double quotation mark. Does that make sense? So if I do this again, and I put another, another question mark, I'm sorry, question mark in front of it, this is everything that has the terms standard deviation, you know, like logged as something as like a function or something that it's doing. 
So there's a, there's a package called NLME that we'll be talking about at some point that, that has a thing where you can look at pooled versus unpooled standard deviations, right? So that should make a little bit of sense to some people in here. Um, Psych, which is a package that we'll be using later on, has another thing that, that, you know, another function that does standard deviations. Does that make sense? So that's a way to search for, for terms that may not be um, what you want them to, and it's, it's, it has to be the double question mark. It has to be the double question mark. The single question mark is sort of like searching for a keyword. And if it's not a keyword, you're not gonna find it. Um, and, and meaning exactly a keyword, right? So with the capitalization being correct and everything. So are there other major questions? Otherwise, like, I'll, I'll hang for a minute, but um, I, mean, I look forward to going on the journey with you guys. And I hope, like, when I showed you the, the point in Clicky that everybody just gave, like, a big internal sigh of relief. Like, <laughs> that, is, that is why, when I sent you the thing on R is taking over the world, that is why R is taking over the world on some levels is because of our commander. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's so fun that we now can for free, we can do like 98% of what we learned in 537 A and B for free. For free. Yes. Yep, and it's one of those things where, you know, if, if, you're, if you're applying for work, I mean, you know, my big concern is always our graduate students, you know, and I mean, people are like, they want SAS, I don't do SAS, they want SPSS, blah, blah, blah. And you know they want different types of expertise. It actually, if you if you bill yourself as an R person, they may not know what you're talking about. But if you tell them, yeah, R is not the program that you're used to using, but like for the incoming students, but it's free, and I can download it to every system in this building. They all go, okay, you can use R. You know, it's really like they want you to be a SAS person because that's what they have on their computers, and they don't want to go negotiate an SPSS license just for you. You know. But having a free, a free open source code program actually makes you more, more marketable in a lot of ways if you can present yourself right and get them to understand what it is. Does that make sense? All right. So I'm here for questions if anybody has them.